Hello everyone, welcome back to Timeline Weekend. This year we've been learning all about how the 66 books of the Bible can be divided into 13 different eras from creation to future. Our hope in learning the Bible timeline together is that you will see that the Bible is actually just a bunch of smaller stories that point to one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. Today, we're finishing up learning about the Old Testament as we look at three new eras together. We know we've covered a lot this year, so before we jump in, let's review what we've learned so far. And as we review, I want you to listen up for how all these stories fit together. Ready? We started at the very beginning in the creation era, where we learned God created everything and it was literally perfect. Until Adam and Eve chose to listen to the enemy and disobey God. This destroyed God's creation and God's relationship with mankind. However, that's when God began his rescue plan to save the world and make a way for people to have a relationship with him again. God would do that by sending a special someone, and that person is Jesus. Next, we learned about the patriarchs era, when God chose Abraham to start a family to represent God to the world. Abraham's family became known as the nation of Israel. God promised to give the Israelites a home and bless all nations and all people by sending them a rescuer that would come from Abraham's family. That rescuer, Jesus. Then there was the Exodus era, when God used Moses to deliver his people from slavery in Egypt and give them the law. But people are not perfect and were unable to follow the law perfectly. But one day, God would send someone who would, and that person is Jesus. Next, we have the conquest era, where God raised up a new leader for the Israelites named Joshua to take over for Moses. They fought many battles before they were able to call the promised land home. One of those battles was the Battle of Jericho, where we met a Canaanite woman named Rahab who helped the Israelites. We also learned that Rahab was an ancestor of Jesus. Our next era is Judges, a not so fun era in Israel's history when we learned that God's people failed over and over again and again in a cycle of disbelief and disobedience. While Judges is marked by failure, it also highlights God's faithfulness to raise up judges to rescue and lead his people. This all points to the ultimate judge who would rescue and lead his people, Jesus. Finally, we have the Kingdom Era, where the Israelites ask God for a king, just like all the nations around them. We see rulers take the throne, like Saul, David, Solomon, and more. In this era, God continues his promise to Abraham by making another very important promise, but this time to King David. God told King David that someone from his family would be king forever and ever and ever. This forever king that would come from David's family is Jesus. Are you noticing a pattern here? Every era points to Jesus. That's because the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. Jesus would come to make a way for anyone who believes in him to be saved from sin and death. Listen up for how you see Jesus in each of the eras we learn about today. We pick up today where we last left off, at the end of the kingdom era. The nation of Israel had divided in two, and people continued to believe that their way was better than God's way. They ignored the messages of the prophets that God had sent to them, warning them to turn back and the consequences that would come if they didn't. Yikes. Let's send things over to my friend Emily, who will take it from here. Hi there! I am so excited to talk to you today about our next era on the Bible timeline, the Exile Era. Exile means to be taken from your home and forced to live someplace else, and that's exactly what happened to the Israelites in the Exile Era. But why? Why did God allow the Israelites to be exiled from their home? Well, back in the Exodus era, God gave the Israelites the law. Not because he was mean and wanted to tell them what to do. God loves his people and wants what's best for them. So he gave them the law to teach, protect, and guide them. But the Israelites were not very good at following God's laws. They sinned against God by breaking his rules and worshiping fake gods. In fact, their sin caused them to divide into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. God sent messengers to the people called prophets. Their message was simple. God loves you. Confess and turn away from your sin. Come back to him. But if you don't, there will be consequences. 
God warned them that if they did not repent, they would be defeated by other nations. Unfortunately, the Israelites kept on sinning and they weren't even sorry about it. Because they refused to listen to him, God allowed them to be conquered and taken away from their home, just like he promised. None of the kings in the north followed God, so God allowed the Assyrians, a wicked nation, to defeat Israel and take them away. 2 Kings 17 tells us, this disaster came upon the people of Israel because they worshiped other gods. They sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them safely out of Egypt and had rescued them from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Judah in the south had a few good kings. Eventually, though, they gave into the same sins as Israel, so God allowed the Babylonians, an even bigger and worse nation, to defeat both the Israelites and the Assyrians. The Babylonians, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, burned the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and forced most people to move to Babylon. The Babylonians left the poorest people in the land to farm it, but they took the best and brightest Israelites, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and gave them leadership positions in Babylon. These four men worked hard to serve the king, but they were loyal first and foremost to the one true God. While in exile, their loyalty to God was tested many times. One time, King Nebuchadnezzar set up a statue of himself and told everyone to bow down and worship it. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. Later, a king named Darius made a law that everyone was to pray only to him and no other god. Daniel would only pray to the one true God, no matter what the king's law said. So he was arrested and thrown into a den of lions. Miraculously, God stepped into both the fiery furnace and the den of lions to protect these men. God showed that he was the one true God worthy of all worship. Although they were in exile because of their sin, God didn't stop loving the Israelites and he had not given up on his promises to them. He was still very much at work and continued to use the prophets to remind the people of his love for them. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God promised that he would be a good shepherd that would take care of them and bring them home. Ezekiel 34 tells us, For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd and rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on that dark and cloudy day. God even told the prophet Jeremiah exactly how long the people would be in exile before they could return home. Listen to this. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. Even through really hard times like the exile era, we can see how the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. Jesus, the only one who can perfectly keep God's law, is the promised king through the line of David that will rule forever. And just as God promised to be a good shepherd to those in exile, Jesus told his followers, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Jesus is the good shepherd for all who believe in him. When King Nebuchadnezzar saw how God rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he told the people, there is no other God who can rescue like this. And he was absolutely right. And just as God rescued the men from the fiery furnace, God has a rescue plan for us today. In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Jesus, God's son, came to earth to sacrifice his life and take the punishment for our sin. When we believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again three days later, God forgives us of our sin and we get to be part of God's family forever. About 70 years after the Babylonians defeated Israel, God raised up the nation of Persia, whose king was a man named Cyrus. The Persians defeated the Babylonians, which meant that now the Israelites were prisoners of the Persians. So now what? Were the Israelites going to be defeated over and over again? What about God's promise to bring them back after 70 years? Were they ever going to return home? I guess we'll have to wait to the next era to find out. All right, back to you, Cam. Wow, I don't know about you, 
but I love being reminded God is always in control, always keeps his promises, and is always at work even when things seem hopeless. That is really great news. Now is a good time to stop and talk about what we just learned. Grownups, a question will appear on your screen. When it does, pause the video and take some time to talk about the questions together. Now is also a good time to stretch because when we come back, we're going to talk about two more eras. All right, question coming at ya. Okay friends, in the next era on the Bible timeline, we get to hear how God kept his promise to bring the Israelites back home. Here's my friend Catherine to tell us more about it. Hi there, I'm excited to talk about the return era, which is the next to last era in the Old Testament found in the Bible timeline. The return era picks up where the last era left off. Israel is in exile. They're stuck in foreign lands for many years. God allowed the Israelites to be conquered by their enemies because they had sinned against God and they weren't sorry about it. He was like a loving parent who was disciplining his children in order to teach them what's best. While it may have felt like God had forgotten them, God had good plans for his people and he wasn't gonna leave them exiled. Even before their enemies defeated Israel, God had promised that they would be exiled for 70 years. And God always keeps his promises. Sure enough, in this next era on our Bible timeline, God allowed the people of Israel to, you guessed it, return home. He even used the kings of their enemies to send the Israelites back in three waves. The first king God used was King Cyrus of Persia. King Cyrus told the people who were in exile that anyone who wanted to return to Jerusalem could pack up and head home. The king not only let them return home, but he sent them back with supplies. This first wave of people was led by a man named Zerubbabel. The people who went in this first wave decided to go and rebuild the temple. Now, why start with the temple? The temple was the place where God's presence dwelt or remained with his people. The temple is where the people of God went to worship the Lord and to offer sacrifices, just like God had instructed. King Solomon, David's son, had built the first temple, but it had been destroyed when they were conquered and taken away into exile. The people of God wanted to rebuild the temple so they could worship God the way they were supposed to. God helped them rebuild it, but there was still something not quite right. Israel had done a lot of good things, but their hearts did not fully trust God. A few years later, another king of Persia named Artaxerxes sent the second wave of Israelites back to Jerusalem led by a man named Ezra. Ezra must have been so excited to go back to the promised land, but when he got there, he was disappointed. When he met the people in Jerusalem, he found that they were not obeying the Lord. The people were doing whatever seemed right in their own eyes and not what God wanted them to do. Ezra loved God's people deeply. So God used Ezra to help teach the people about God's character, his word, and how they should live. Ezra knew what was most important to God, the people's hearts. Remember, God always wants his people to trust him and obey his word not because we're supposed to, but because we believe that he is good, he loves us, and his way is best. Finally, a third wave of Israelites were led to the promised land by a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah had heard that Jerusalem didn't have a wall, and this made him sad. King Artaxerxes not only let Nehemiah go rebuild the wall, but he also protected him on his journey and sent him there with supplies. Now, why did Nehemiah rebuild the wall? To protect the city. It hadn't been that many years since Israel had been defeated and taken into exile. Now that they were back in Jerusalem, the city needed to be protected along with those who lived in it. This was no ordinary wall. This wall was to be built 10 feet thick and was to go around the entire city. But it wasn't just the size of this wall that was a problem. There were also people who didn't want this wall to be built and they tried to stop him. But God was with Nehemiah. And with his help, Nehemiah and the Israelites were able to build the wall in just 52 days. Did you notice there was a lot of rebuilding in this era? While rebuilding the temple and the wall were important, what was most important to God was the rebuilding of the people's hearts. God used men like Ezra to remind the people that what God wanted more than the building or actions was for their heart to trust that God loved them and God had good plans for them. God also spoke through prophets and gave promises of a future king who would come to rescue them and rule forever. 
In Micah 5, 2, it describes this king as being born in the town of Bethlehem. And Zechariah 9, 9 describes this promised king this way. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. God's desire for people to love him wasn't just for the Israelites in the return era. Remember, the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to one big, true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. Just like he wanted the Israelites to know, love, and trust him, God wants you to know, love, and trust him too. God is always more concerned with what's going on in our hearts than what we can build or do for him. That is why 400 years after the return era, Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, came to love, serve, and teach his people to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. But Jesus wasn't just another good teacher or prophet. He was way more than that. When he entered into Jerusalem a week before he died on the cross, he came in riding on a donkey, just like Zechariah 9.9 described, in order to show the people that he was the king God had promised. His death on the cross made a way for people to be forgiven for their sins and fully return back to God with all their heart. That's what God wanted in the return era, and that's what God wants from us today too. There's one more thing that might be helpful for you to know before we go. Not all of the Israelites left the foreign lands and went back to Jerusalem. One of these people was a girl named Esther who lived in Persia. Esther had won a beauty pageant and her prize was to marry the king. Through these events, God placed her in the right place at the right time so he could use her to save his people from being killed. You can read all about her story and the book of the Bible named after her. One thing that's important to note about the book of Esther though, is that God's name is never mentioned. He may have seemed silent, but it is clear that he was working behind the scenes in order to use Esther to rescue his people. In fact, Esther's story gives us a glimpse of how God is going to work all throughout the next era on our Bible timeline, the silence era. But that's all for now. So back to you, Cam. I'm so glad we serve a God who's in the business of rebuilding and making all things new. While there are consequences for sin, the return era reminds us that God's rescue plan through Jesus is about bringing his people home to be with him forever. Okay, people, we are about to talk about our third and final era of the day, which also means we've reached the final era on the Bible timeline before we move into the New Testament. But first, let's take a quick break. If you have a favorite dance move, now's the time to break it out. All right, in our final era of today, we enter into a 400 year period where the Israelites did not hear from God. While God was silent, we know he was still at work. Here to teach us is my friend, Neil. Hi there. I'm so excited to talk to you about our final era today, the silence era. During the return era, God's people returned to Jerusalem after being exiled by a foreign nation. While they were still ruled by the foreign empire of Persia, they were able to rebuild in their own land. And the Old Testament actually ends with the return era. But we have one more era to talk about today before we get to the New Testament, and that's the silence era. The silence era is different from every other era that we've talked about so far. Why? There are no books of the Bible written during the silence era because God didn't speak to his people for, wait for it, 400 years. He was silent. Everything that happened during this era is normally known as ancient history. Famous battles were fought, epic stories were written, and there were building projects everywhere. Do you think that because God was silent during this time, that means he was just up in heaven taking a nap? Not at all. Even though God did not speak, he was still working behind the scenes, making sure everything was ready for Jesus to arrive. Soon after the Israelites returned to rebuild in Jerusalem, a new empire took over, the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire was led by a man named Alexander the Great, who was called that because he was a great conqueror and never lost a battle. Alexander loved taking over new cities, but he loved something even more, the Greek language and culture, or way of life. Every time Alexander the Great would conquer a new city, 
He would make everyone in that city learn to speak the Greek language and do things the Greek way. And while this may seem like a not very nice thing to do, conquer cities and make everyone speak the same language, it was actually really helpful for people to be able to talk to each other. Soon after, another empire came along to conquer the Greeks, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the biggest empire the world had ever seen. As they conquered more and more cities, they built huge buildings and things called aqueducts that could carry water for miles and miles. Most importantly, they built roads, thousands of miles of roads all over the empire. This may not seem like a big deal to us now, but travel was really hard back then because the roads were so bad. And the roads that the Romans built made traveling around the empire way easier. Now, the Romans said they wanted peace in the empire, but they did a lot of fighting to try and get it. Roman soldiers were mean, and they tried to force everyone to be peaceful by scaring them into obeying. These were the same people who invented crucifixion, which is death by hanging on a cross. That sure doesn't sound like peace to me. This is a world that God's people, now known as the Jews, found themselves in during the Silence Era. Things were pretty tough, and worst of all, God wasn't talking to them. Some of the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, told the people that they had to follow God's rules in order for him to be happy, instead of remembering that God cared most about the heart. They even created extra rules that were extra hard to follow, thinking that that would cause God to love them. But God never stopped loving them. He was with them all through the silence era, and he wanted them to hold on to the hope of the promise that he made way back in the creation era, that he would send a Messiah to rescue them. As we have made our way through the eras in the Old Testament, we have seen that the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to the one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan. Who is this Messiah or rescuer? The rescuer was Jesus, the Son of God, who came into the world and lived a perfect life that no one could live, died on a cross to pay for our sins, and then rose from the dead. Jesus was coming, and God used all the events of the silence era to make everything just right for his arrival. Think about this. If you had an amazing story that you wanted everyone to hear about, don't you think it would be helpful if everyone spoke the same language? And if you wanted that story to be shared all around the world, wouldn't it be helpful if travel was a bit easier? Absolutely. The Greeks and Romans may have had their own plans, but God used it for his purposes and his glory. Because all the people spoke the same Greek language and could travel on the Roman roads, it made it so much easier for the gospel of Jesus to spread to the whole world. God wants everyone to know that the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to the one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. But in the meantime, God's people had to wait and hold on to hope. For 400 years, they had to wait in silence for their Messiah, their rescuer, wondering when he would come, what he would be like, what he would do, and if they would even recognize him when they saw him. Jesus the rescuer would come, but he was not going to come as the rescuer that they expected. He was going to be so much better. But that's a story for another time. All right, friends, that's all for now. So Cam, sending it back to you. Amazing. Friends, are all these stories of God's power and faithfulness encouraging you? Why don't you take a little time to talk about what you just learned in the silence era? Grown-ups, one final question is going to pop up on the screen. When it does, pause the video. Once you're done, we can wrap up our time together today. Wow, we learned a lot of information today and a lot about the Bible timeline. Can you run through the hand motions with me for each of the eras we've learned about so far? Our timeline starts in the creation era, where we learn God created the heavens and the earth. Next, the patriarchs era, where we meet Abraham and his special family. Next up is the exodus era, when God rescued his people from Egypt, followed by the conquest era, where God gave his people the land he had promised them. After that came the judges era, followed by the kingdom era, which were full of some good and some bad leaders that led to exile in a foreign land until they were able to return home. We wrapped up our time today with 400 years of silence, where God didn't speak, but we know was definitely still at work. While we may have come to the end of the Old Testament eras on the Bible timeline 
God's story does not end there. Remember, the Bible is a bunch of smaller stories that point to one big true story, the story of God and his rescue plan through Jesus. God sent his son Jesus to make a way for anyone who believes in him to be saved from sin and death. And we'll see when that happens when we kick off our next era in the New Testament on the Bible timeline. But until then, thanks for joining us. See you next time.